So I want us to make a proclamation. We haven't done that for a while. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Amen. Of course, we know the law is speaking about the Holy Scripture, the Holy Word that we will be journeying through. So let's say that again. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Let us pray together. God of love and grace, what a blessing and privilege it is for us to be together in this sanctuary. We come before you with grateful hearts to thank you and to bless your holy name. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask as we embark on this journey as a church, that your word that comes forth, Lord, will accomplish those things to which you are sending them to do, a transformative, empowering work in our lives. I thank you for this assembly here, for this wonderful privilege to break the bread of life. Thank you for the team, Lord, who are supporting me, those that will deliver part of this series. Thank you, Lord, for those who are involved in the media presentations. Thank you for those who are praying. Lord, may we receive your word and may our eyes be open to see wonderful things, truths, Lord, things that maybe we've understood, but Lord, you say that we, we go from faith to faith. Lord, may we see more clearly as we journey through this series. Thank you for your anointing now upon me and all of us, Lord. And may we be empowered by the Holy Spirit to be your witnesses in the earth. For this, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through to 11 is a portion of scripture that I want to speak to this morning. We will do some exposition on that passage in a while, but because this is the first in this series, I want to take some time to set uh, a context and lay some sort of foundation that hopefully we can then build on as we go forward. I believe that this is a very important study for the time that we're living in. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to be active in our lives and in the church. So let me just begin by saying that this is an important book in the Bible because without the book of Acts we wouldn't have a clear understanding of how the early church began. Now you can read the epistles and from that you can deduce certain things but the book of Acts allows us to see clearly how the church which started with around 120 people as you will see how did it grow from that, from a place in Jerusalem and spread to the then known world, which then brought into the kingdom of God millions of people? Without the book of Acts, we wouldn't be able to find out how this happened. So it's a very important book. As I said, it's an action-packed book, but I want to just give a word of caution here. At the beginning and it's important to understand how the book is written and how this history is recorded so there are two ways that we can write history or we can record history we can record history on a day by day basis so the writer of this book could have recorded every single day over a period of about 30 years what took place but that would be a very very long account so what the author does here is choose to look at the timeline which is from about AD 30 to AD 60 AD 70 roughly a 30 year period and the author moves down the timeline 
He zooms in on specific and certain events and activities and then he zooms out. So he zooms in and he opens up a window and then he explains, well, this is what happens here. And then he zooms out and he moves along maybe to the next significant event. So that's how the book of Acts is written. Why is it important to understand that? Well, it's important because we can become frustrated because if we look at church today and look at the book of Acts, we're going to say, well, this is dull in comparison to what's happening in the book of Acts. I mean, there were miracles and people being set free from prison and all sorts of things going on. But it's important that we understand that this took place over a 30-year period. We can probably read it in one sitting. But when you work it out, and I know there are many more miracles and happenings which aren't recorded in the book of Acts, but we're probably looking at two miracles a year that took place. So we don't have to beat ourselves up and wondering how come we're not raising the dead and the, the blind are not seeing and our shadows are not healing people every single day of the week. I don't believe that was the norm for them either, even though the power of the Spirit was, was moving in tremendous ways. So it's important to see that these believers had to walk by faith too. There were times where they probably felt that God wasn't with them. So it wasn't just all glory, glory and miracles. No, the just live by faith. I am sure there were times when they were down and they needed to walk by faith and exercise faith. So there were seasons when they had to trust God to bring them through. Pretty much like what we have to do. But on the other hand, in the spirit of balance, I want to say that what we see in the book of Acts is the most potent and powerful move of the Spirit of God in the church ever, in church history. What we see happening in the book of Acts. So we see that spiritually, I would say that they, they were richer than the church today. Today the church may have lots of things materially, yes? But you could almost say that some parts of the church spiritually are, is quite poor. Well, maybe they didn't have a lot of riches, but spiritually they were empowered and they were rich. So I want to say to us, if we determine in our heart to walk this journey together and look intently at this book, that God is going to transform our lives. And God will help us to appropriate the power of the Holy Spirit to become witnesses in the earth. And that's the whole thrust of the book. So, as I said, we're not just studying to gather knowledge, but we're, we're studying that we may be enriched, empowered, and hence released to be witnesses in the earth. And I expect that as we journey through this book, we are going to do things that we've never done before. I heard one amen. <laughs> things are going to happen in this church, in your personal lives and circumstances, that you will know that wasn't me. That was the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Does anybody believe that in this house? Why else would God take us on this journey? <laughs> Amen. So I come to this with an expectant heart, and I hope you come with an expectant heart. And let me just say, as God speaks to us, because he will be speaking to us from the pages of Scripture, sometimes God is going to expect us to change our point of view. Sometimes God is going to expect us to change circumstances in our lives purposely, intentionally. God is going to expect us to adjust our attitudes. So we don't just look at the scripture because it's, you know, it's a nice story. God wants to use his word. It's God's voice. The, the pages of scripture is God's voice speaking to us. So if you want to hear God speak to you, it's easy. Pick up your Bible. It's easy. Pick up your Bible and read your Bible and you will hear 
God speaking to you. That's the primary way that God speaks to us. Okay, so what is the focus of the book of Acts? We, we heard Dr. Acker call it, as it does in, in some Bibles, it's named the Acts of the Apostles, and some even call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. But really the focus of the book of Acts is Jesus Christ, Him crucified and resurrected. That's the focus of the book of Acts. And we can make the focus be all sorts of things. But the focus of the book of Acts is Jesus Christ, him crucified and resurrected. As we journey through, you will see that every single sermon, without exception, in the book of Acts, revolves around the death of Jesus and his resurrection every single sermon preached in this book is centered on the death and resurrection of jesus and in fact in first corinthians 2 paul said i know nothing among you except christ and him crucified so the book records the spread of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why my theme today is, it's all about Jesus. The book of Acts is all about Jesus. As I said, some want to make it the focus of the Holy Spirit. And yes, the Holy Spirit is quite prominent, particularly in the first chapters. But we have to remember that Jesus said, and this is recorded in John 16, 13 to 14. Jesus said the Holy Spirit comes not concerning himself, but to glorify the Son. So the Holy Spirit came in the book of Acts and is present with us today not to draw attention to himself. The Holy Spirit has not come to give us goose pimples and exciting worship experiences. Yes, he can do that. But his primary purpose is to point to Jesus. So how do you know the Holy Spirit is at work? If what's happening is pointing to Jesus, then you can be pretty much sure the Holy Spirit is at work. If what is happening is pointing to self or some other agenda, you can guarantee that the Holy Spirit is not in that. It's simple. So Jesus in this book is mentioned about 200 times in comparison to the Holy Spirit being mentioned about 40 times. I want to talk a bit about the author. The author is Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke. And we know that from the scripture that Luke is a physician. Luke is a, a, a medical doctor. And in fact, in Colossians 4, Paul calls him the beloved physician. What we see here that Luke has a, a writing style and vocabulary that tells us that he was a very intelligent man. Not just because he was a doctor, but he was a very intelligent man. And he uses very precise language in recording both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And in fact... He uses about 40 Greek words in his writing that's found nowhere else in the New Testament. Luke was probably the closest and most loyal friend to the Apostle Paul. 2 Timothy 4, Paul said that all had forsaken him apart from Luke. So it seems that Luke joined Paul and we know this, if you read Acts chapter 16, you will see a change in the use of the personal pronouns in that chapter. It seems as if in chapter 16, Luke joins Paul and Silas on the missionary journey. And, you know, when you think about this, you can see the providence of God in, in this. Because when you read the life of the Apostle Paul, the scripture says that he had a thorn in the flesh. And he prayed to God to remove this. And God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. Some reckon that was probably a challenge he had with his eyesight, some say. And it could have been a result 
of him being beaten. He'd, re- he'd received stripes for the sake of the gospel many times. So Paul was often in situations where he had uh, health conditions that needed attention. So who does God bring into Paul's life to be his best and closest companion? A medical doctor. Amen. So the people that God brings into your life, there's a reason why you have your friends and your family and relatives. Amen. So can you imagine that Luke must have been attending to Paul's sores and his eye challenge, if that's what it was, his thorn in the flesh, on his journey as he was focused on bringing the message of the gospel, particularly to the Gentiles. And we also know from scripture that Luke was a Gentile. And in fact, he's the only Gentile contributor to the writing of scripture. History tells us that he was martyred in Greece. He was hung from an olive tree for the sake of the gospel. Now Luke originally wrote a large book in two volumes. So volume one would be the gospel of Luke and volume two would be the book of Acts. In our Bible, that's, that's separated out, isn't it? But it, it's a good thing that if you're going to read through the book of Acts, that you read through the book of Luke first of all and then go on to the book of Acts, which I'm in the process of putting together another Bible reading plan and that's what we're going to do. We'll read through Luke and then we'll make our way into the book of Acts. So that gives us some sort of context and some sort of background. I want to go to the text now. So I'm going to be reading from Acts chapter 1, the first two verses. And it says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Amen. So you notice it begins here by saying the former account. Well, what is that? The former account that was written to Theophilus is the gospel of Luke. So he's saying, I've already written to you. In my former account, I I, I wrote the account of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, all that took place in his life, including his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. You can find the end of the account, Luke chapter 24. And this is really where Luke is picking up in Acts chapter 1, from Luke 24, segueing into Acts chapter 1. And notice it says, In the former account I wrote of all Jesus began. That's important there, that word began. All that Jesus began. If you fast forward to the end of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 28, what you won't find there is a closing exhortation. You won't find a benediction, as in many of the other writings in the New Testament. Acts ends abruptly. It's almost as if Luke ran out of ink or parchment or time or something. He just... just, ends you know Paul is a is a under house arrest and people are coming and going and visiting him and it just it just stops there and I think what this is communicating to us that there is a continuation of the book of Acts guess guess who's continuing the book of Acts well the apostles and the followers of Christ in the in the first century they continued but we the body of Christ are writing further chapters in the book of Acts. So this former account Luke wrote, he mentioned, this is the gospel of Luke, and he's writing to someone whose name is Theophilus. And we don't know much about Theophilus, but in Luke's account, in his gospel, Luke 1, 3, he addresses him as most excellent Theophilus. And some say, some scholars say, in the Greek that Theophilus is a title for a Roman official. 
Perhaps they surmise that Theophilus was a, a, a wealthy person, a Roman official, and he, he has slaves. So in that, in that day, anybody with that sort of uh, wealth would have a doctor as a slave. So that, this is all speculation, okay? So you won't find this in the scripture. This is speculation from the scholars. So some scholars reckon that Luke was perhaps a slave of this Roman official, and at some point, again, speculation, maybe Theophilus, this Roman official, came to faith in Jesus Christ and released Luke to join Paul on his missionary journeys. So that's speculation, but it's food for thought. So again, Luke is saying here to Theophilus, he's writing to him, following on from the Gospel of Luke, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Jesus began to do and teach in his physical body of the flesh. That's recorded in the Gospel of Luke. But what we see is Jesus still at work in the book of Acts, but not in his physical body, but his spirit indwelling in believers. He continues to do and teach. I want us to notice here the order of effective ministry. The order of effective ministry is to do and teach. Not just teach, but to do and to teach. When we do and teach, we have more spiritual and moral authority and power. Imagine a parent who does drugs saying to their own child, child, drugs are not good for you. <laughs> Don't do drugs. By virtue of that parent doing the opposite to what they're saying to their child, to that degree they lose spiritual and moral authority. And that's why the ministry of Jesus was so powerful, because he was totally submitted to obeying the Father. He did the word of God. He did obedience. And that's why they said, you teach with such authority. Not because he was a, a good orator, and he was, but because they saw him do and teach. If we're going to be effective in ministry, church, we have to do and we have to teach. Can I get an amen right there? We have to do and we have to teach. Verse 3. To whom he also presented himself alive. This is speaking of Jesus. After his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. I'll read the first clause of verse 4. And being assembled together with them. And I'm glad that uh, Dr. Acker read from the NIV today because in that version where it speaks about being assembled together, it says that Jesus ate with them. So that's not in every version, but I've noticed it in the NIV and certain other versions as well. So in, in these verses here, we, we have a time marker of 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension. So that's, that's where that comes from. The time marker, if you ever wondered, how do we know that Jesus ascended 40 days after his resurrection? Well, there it is, in verse 3. And Jesus appeared over this period of 40 days many times to his followers. And it says here that his appearances were infallible. They were convincing proofs that Jesus was alive. He had been raised from the dead. In fact, if we look at this Greek word here that says appeared, it's the word from which we get our English word opth ophthalmologist. Ophthalmologist. I was worrying about pronouncing that all night. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I won't say it again, but that word means eye doctor. Eye doctor. When you go to the optician, what do they do? They, they look into your eyes, don't they? 
Yeah, they get these things and come right up in your face and tell you to read things and, and all of that. And sometimes put drops in your eyes to dilate your pupil and all of that. They look at and examine your eyes. So this is saying that Jesus appeared. This was not an hallucination. He appeared. They eyeballed him. And I remember back in the early 80s, I had a cousin that lived on the south side of Birmingham. And he, he had a CB radio. Now, this was before mobile phones, <laughs> you know, were around. Anybody, can anyone remember those days before you had a mobile phone? Yeah. So my, my cousin, he was an enthusiast, a radio ham, you know. Get on the CB and uh, talking to truckers and people, yeah. So one day, anyway, we went down to visit our cousin's south side of Birmingham and my cousin he was a little older than than we were he was on the CB talking to somebody and he was talking to this gentleman and this gentleman said that he has uh, some sort of a special aerial that allows him to view television broadcasts from Europe outside of the UK and my cousin was absolutely fascinated uh, by this. So as he was talking to you, he said, I want to eyeball with you. I said, okay, so what, what does that mean? In other words, I want to come and see this for myself. You can see TV broadcasts. Remember, this was before Sky, before Virgin, bef- before BT, and all these offerings. In those days, we probably had three channels. And you had to get up and press the button on the TV set to change the channel over. So that's where I'm going back to. Now you know how old I am. So he said, I want to eyeball with you. So I said, my cousin was a little older than us. He had a car. So we jumped in this car with my cousin and we drove over to the northwest side of Birmingham. And we met up with this, this fella and we went into his flat. And when we got in there, indeed, he had a television and some special contraption or aerial that was picking up TV stations from Europe because we didn't recognize those stations. It was faint. It wasn't a very strong picture. But we we eyeballed it. We eyeballed it. This scripture is saying that when Jesus appeared, it wasn't a hallucination. They eyeballed him. They looked at him intently. In fact... The scripture tells us that doubting Thomas, he didn't believe, did he, that Jesus was raised from the dead. And about a week after, Jesus appears suddenly in the room where Thomas was. And uh, he said, Thomas, it's me. Come and touch my side. Come and touch my hands. And what was Thomas's response? He said, my Lord and my God. It's really you, Jesus. It's not a hallucination. It's not some kind of ghost. It's really you. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 to 8 says that Jesus appeared to Cephas and then to the 12 after he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and at last he appeared to me also. So I, th- I find it amazing that Jesus appeared to 500 witnesses. That would stand up in the court of law. So if you went to court and said, Judge, I'm not guilty. I didn't do it. And then 500 people came behind and said, We saw him do it. You're going down. <laughs> Definitely. And Paul said, if you don't believe that Jesus is alive, the most of these 500 witnesses are still alive. You go and talk to them. And we know that through the centuries, many have come and tried to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But you know what? To date, not one of them has proved that he was not raised from the dead. And this text, I just want to look at this quickly. In verse 3, here are three proofs that Jesus was raised from the dead. It says that they saw him. They eyeballed him. They saw him. 
Second, he said he spoke to them about the kingdom. He, they didn't only just see him, but he spoke to them about specific things about the kingdom of God. And in the first line of, of verse 4, in the NIV, he says that he ate with them. Dopey can't eat. <laughs> because where's the food going to go? He ate with them. And we also know that he appeared to them one time on the beach and they cooked up some fish and ate it. So they weren't having hallucinations. Jesus was raised from the dead. Amen. You find that funny? Amen. So he was present. They saw him visibly. He spoke to them. He ate with them and i think what jesus is doing over this 40 day period is getting the disciples used to knowing that he is with them even when they can't see him does anybody know that that even when you can't see jesus he's with you i think it's remarkable that thomas doubting thomas he said what he said i don't i won't believe until i see jesus but Jesus was there. Jesus heard what he said. So the first thing Jesus says when he turns up is, Thomas, I heard what you said. I'm here. Now you touch my side and look at my hands. That comforts me. That when we're going through it, brethren, when we don't feel the presence of God, when we can't see anything that's given us any, any signs of hope, Jesus is with us. Amen. 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 So if you pray and say, God, are you hearing me? Yes, he's hearing you. And he will appear, he will turn up, and he will do what he needs to do in your life and situation. I hope that encourages somebody today. Jesus is with us, whether we can see him or not. And he's transitioning the disciples. Remember, they've been with him for three and a half years. They've been used to his physical presence. They've been used to calling on him, Jesus, we're drowning, wake up. But now he was gone. But Jesus is saying, I'm still with you. You can still call on me. I will hear you and I will answer your prayers. Amen. Let's go on to, or continue from verse 4. What we have in verse 4 are the very last words of Jesus Christ before he ascends. And we have to ascribe gravity and weight to that. Anyone's last words are going to be very important, aren't they? I mean, if I knew I had an hour to live, I wouldn't be talking to my family about trivial things. Like, it, cool today, isn't it? Isn't it, is it cool today? I, I wouldn't be talking about things like that. I'll be talking some serious things. And this is what Jesus do, is doing, because these are his last words. He knows he's going to be taken up in a short while. So he says this, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now on. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They said to him, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Amen. So Jesus is speaking here about the baptism of the Holy Spirit which would take place from that uh, where they were there in 10 days time. They would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So again, not a time marker. So we're seeing that. Between the resurrection of Jesus and the, the Holy Spirit being poured out, there's a period of 50 days. Penta means 50, Pentecost means 50 days. But what I really want us to see here is there are three levels or three ways in which the Holy Spirit relates to us. This is important. 
The first is he is with us. The Holy Spirit is with us. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is with every single one of us, whether you're a born again believer or unbeliever. But the sole purpose of the Holy Spirit being with the unbeliever is to bring that individual to faith in Jesus Christ. That's the sole purpose of the Holy Spirit being with the unbeliever. And then secondly, the Holy Spirit is in us. When you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, when you are birthed into the kingdom, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you as a believer. So for those of us who are Christians, the Holy Spirit indwells us. He lives in the child of God. So we're saved now. When he's in us, we're saved from the coming judgment. We're saved from the wrath of God. If we were to die or the, or the rapture was to occur and the Holy Spirit's living in you, you go to heaven. We're saved. Amen. But there's a third level or third relationship, which is that the Holy Spirit comes upon us. And this is to empower us to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. He empowers us to be ambassadors for Christ. And God, as the prophet Joel says, in these last days, he is pouring out his spirit on all flesh. Amen. I just want to look at this now. So this, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, and as we go through this study, we're going to get more into that. So I'm not going to, I'm going to stay on my track um, today. It's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some call it the second blessing. Some call it an overflowing, empowering, whatever you want to call it. It's the Holy Spirit coming upon us to empower us to be witnesses. The word baptism means to immerse. To immerse. So there's two ways you can be immersed in water. You can either go down into a pool like this and we, we dip you under completely. Or you can stand under a waterfall. Either way, you're going to get immersed. But it means more than that. It means to be immersed in an environment that is foreign to your nature. To be immersed in an environment that is foreign to your nature. So when we have baptisms here and we baptize the candidates, being under the water is foreign to human nature, isn't it? Because if we stay under there too long, what will happen? Yeah, because we're not meant to live under water. So it's to be immersed in an environment that is foreign to your nature. That's what baptism means. Well, I want to say to you that alongside being baptized in water, there is another baptism that is available to believers. And it's a baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism when the Holy Spirit comes upon the believer. And in the same way, it means that we are immersed in the Holy Spirit in an environment that is not natural to us as human beings. You know, most of us are quite timid to share our faith. Anyone take every single opportunity you have to share your faith with someone? Most of the times we're chicken out of it, don't we? But when we are immersed in the power of the Holy Spirit, that's where we get boldness from to share our faith. So Jesus saying in his final words, so these are very important words. He's saying God wants to immerse you in an environment that is foreign to your fallen nature to empower and overflow you with his spirit so you have power to speak boldness to live and be ambassadors god wants us to be instruments of change so the primary reason for this third relationship with the holy spirit holy spirit coming upon us it's not so much for us but it's to empower us to touch the lives of others, to see others born into the kingdom. Ephesians 5.18 says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And in the Greek, that's written in the present imperative tense. So it's not a once in a lifetime experience, as we would sometimes believe in our church circles. 
It's a continual replenishment, as you will see in Acts 2, 4, Acts 4, 31. Now, I just want to just blow some myths about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not to make us happy, contrary to popular belief. God doesn't pour out his spirit on us to make us feel happy. You may feel happy when that happens, but that's not the primary purpose. It's so that we are witnesses. We have to keep that in sharp focus. It's not primarily to speak in tongues either. Although I believe that is a legitimate gift of the Spirit, and we see that in Acts chapter 2, we see in Acts chapter 10, that when the Holy Spirit was poured out, they spoke in tongues. Well, there are also references in the book of Acts when it says that they were filled, and it doesn't mention the speaking of tongues. So it's not primarily for us to speak in tongues. And let me just say here, you know, one of the things that really held me back from receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit was the experiences that I heard other people share. You know, people would say, well, I was praising God and then Jesus appeared in front of me. Or I saw some angel, or I saw some river or something and I, I dived in it and I'd be looking for these things. <laughs> And nothing of the sort happened to me. It's something that you receive by faith, just as you receive salvation by faith. You receive that outpouring, that baptism by faith. So don't let someone else's experience kind of entrap you and think, well, it can't be real because I didn't see anything or I didn't feel anything. I was in my bedroom when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I just prayed, I'd gone to bed, I was lying down. And I felt something come over me and my tongue was, I'm thinking, what? I thought it was a demon attacking me. <laughs> and I jumped up out of my bed and my brother was next door. I must have heard a rumble and he came in and he said, what's going on? I told him, he said, I, I think it's a, it's the Holy Spirit. And we prayed and immediately I started to speak in a language that I hadn't studied or, or learnt. What I'm saying, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just about speaking in tongues. It's more than that. It's not about mystical spiritual experiences and having visions and walking with angels. That's not the primary purpose for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Nor is it about having fantastic worship experiences and goosebumps and having emotional highs and running around church and doing leapfrogs. And it's not about that. And am I saying that your emotions are not involved? No, I'm not saying emotions are not involved. Because we are emotional beings. One of the scriptures, I believe it's in Romans, says that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness is not an emotion. Righteousness is about being on the right side of God's justice. But joy and peace are emotions. So you may experience emotional lifts and uh, being joyful and happy but it's not about emotions if you think about a steam locomotive it has power do you, do you think the steam in the, for, in the locomotive is just to blow and toot the horn <laughs> you think that's what all that power and steam is there for no the steam in a locomotive is to power that train to its destination Yes, they do toot the horn if someone's on the line or whatever to warn. Or maybe to say hello to someone on the journey. But the steam is primarily to power that 200 ton train to its destination. And it's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. It's not to give us happy emotions and run around church and all of that. If we want to look at it as, as, as a train being the church, the Holy Spirit powering us to our destination, which is heaven. And as we're traveling down the track to our destination, we toot the horn, yes, and we say, get on board. Redemption draws nigh. So it's that way around, brethren. The Holy Spirit is empowering us to be effective witnesses 
to bring the church of Jesus Christ to its destination. And as we're traveling, we call out to those who are lost around us and say, it's time to be saved. Today is a day of salvation. Amen. The other thing I want to say about the, the, the empowering of the Holy Spirit is not so much about what we do. It's about what God wants us to become. God is more interested in what he is making of us than what we do. But sometimes we think it's more about the activities, don't we? And we put premium on what we do. It's not so much about what we do. It's about what God wants to make us into. Is God making our lives evidence that when people look at us, they say, Jesus is real. Because if God could change you, he can change me. Is there enough convicting evidence by the way that we live that people can look at us and be convicted? Because we are what they see before they come to church. We are what they see perhaps before they even pick up a Bible. Our work colleagues, our friends at school, the people that we meet in the market, they see us. Is there enough evidence to point them by the Holy Spirit to Jesus and say, this is real, Jesus is alive, he's resurrected, he's changed the life of that individual. That's what God wants us to do, to shine our lights before men. And then the scripture says here, in John 7, 37. So who is who's this uh, baptism? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Who is it for? Jesus says, whoever is thirsty. John 7, 37. Come and drink and out of him will flow torrents of living water. God is seeking to do more in our lives. Amen. Are you satisfied with how you're living at the moment? If you're satisfied, you'll just continue living as you are. Or do you want more? Because if you want more, Jesus says, if you're thirsty, come and drink. And out of your belly, out of your innermost being, will flow rivers of living water. And this power of the Holy Spirit is resurrection power. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. You know what I like about resurrection power? It works best in cemeteries. That's where the power works best. In dead situations, when you have given up hope on life, that's where resurrection power kicks in and it works. It doesn't just work in a, in a church building. Resurrection power upon us works out in the public space, in your workplaces. That's where resurrection power works. So you don't have to be afraid to interface with whoever on whatever level because resurrection power works best in dead situations. And then we notice they ask the Lord, will you restore the kingdom of Israel at this time? And he said, it's not for you to know the times and seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. That's saying to me that we don't need to know everything. And in fact, we won't know everything. We won't understand everything. But one day we will know fully, even as we are known, because we view in the glass now a dim image. But one day when we're changed, we will see Christ face to face and have a much better understanding of our own journey and the plan of the kingdom of God. And then in verse 9 it says, And now when he has spoken these things, when Jesus has spoken these things, while they watched, while they eyeballed, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So I think th this is a word of comfort. Jesus has been taken away, but he said he will return. So these two men, who are they? Well, they're probably angels. They're dressed in white. And they may be the same two men recorded in Luke 
24.5. You will recall there that these men asked very probing questions to the women who went with spices to the tomb of Jesus on that Sunday morning. And they found the stone rolled away. And the angels or the two men asked, why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? So here in Acts, it could be the same two men. We don't know. But as Jesus is taken up before his followers, these two men said to them, what are you standing here looking at? <laughs> they asked another probing question. He's, in other words, they're saying, don't just stand there, do something. I got that from the Flintstones. <laughs> Show my age again. So as Jesus is taken up, the angel is saying, don't just stand there, do what Jesus told you to do. And you know, sometimes we can be like rabbits in the headlights, just caught up with some uh, glorious experience that we've had with the Lord. Well, the Lord is saying to us, don't just stand there, do something. There needs to be action that comes out of our, our worship, our prayer, our study. Action has to follow, and it's a matter of urgency. And notice that what they do in this 10-day period, they go to prayer. And that links in so nicely with what we studied in Nehemiah. Prayer is a thing that they go to. That's their final resort. I want to end by saying, remember that God is taking us on this journey because he wants to transform us. I want us to hold that at the very heart of all these messages that come forward. God wants to transform us. I don't know about you, but I'm not satisfied with where I'm at at this point in time. There must be a stirring of a hunger in us in this critical and crucial time in which we are living. God wants our lives to be evidence that Jesus Christ is resurrected. He is Lord and he is Savior. I want to close with one thought. You notice that Luke went through a lot of effort to write these two volumes to one person, Theophilus. So all his research, and it must have taken him a long time to put all this together. He was writing to one man. He wasn't writing, I don't believe, because he knew it was going to become part of the canon of Scripture and that we will be reading it today and we'll be studying it. No. He wrote to one man. And I want to end by asking you, who is your Theophilus? Who is God laying upon your heart? Maybe just one person that you would be prepared to put the same level of effort as Luke to pull together all that detail to write to one person. Who is God laying on your heart this afternoon? That he's saying, I want you to be a witness to that one person. It could be a family member, could be a neighbor, could be a friend, could be a work colleague, could be one of your peers. Who is God laying on your heart? I hope that God is laying somebody on your heart and that we will be prepared to sacrifice and make the effort to reach that one individual. Because in reaching Theophilus with this volume, we have it today. If Luke hadn't had written and made, made that effort, we wouldn't have it to read today. So who knows what God will do with our efforts as we perhaps just focus on one individual in praying for that person, in sharing love with that person, in shining our light all over that person so they can see evidence of the resurrection in our lives. Are we prepared to leave the 90 and 9? And reach the one for those of us who are saved I'm not necessarily asking you to raise your hand for this or come forward but the Holy Spirit is in you and God is doing a transformative work in you but sometimes we resist that transformation sometimes God tells us to move on give up certain things maybe change of friends maybe change of places that we frequent maybe change of habits Holy Spirit is speaking 
But, you know, we can suppress that. Did you know that? We can suppress that to our detriment. But God wants to do a transformative work in you. I want to pray for you. You don't have to indicate to me. Just be honest in your heart and say, Lord, that's me. And you'll be included in this prayer. And then there are some of us who haven't experienced that third relationship with the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit being poured out upon us to make us effective witnesses. Now, I'm not suggesting we're going to have a tarrying service now. But we're journeying through this book so there will be plenty of opportunities as we look at the scripture. To say, Lord, I'm thirsty. I want more of you. I want to experience that. I want to be your evidence in the earth that Jesus Christ is alive. Again, let's just own up to that if that's where we're at. I'm in, I'm in that. I'm in that category. I have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, I want more. I want to be a more effective witness. So I'm in that category. I'm also in the second category in terms of God transforming my life and me uh, letting go of certain things and not being so stubborn and holding on to my way and thinking, you know, I'm, I'm going to just do it my way, Lord. I, I don't want to surrender to you fully. I'm in that category too. And if we're honest, all of us as believers are in that category. So we're going to pray together. Amen. Let's pray for those who are not Christians. You're in here or you're watching online. All of us, we're going to pray that God, by the blood of Jesus, will loose them from every excuse, every shackle of sin and free them today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Can we pray that for a minute and then we'll move on to the other prayer. Yeah. Let's pray for every unbeliever in this sanctuary, those who are connecting with us virtually, we are going to pray for you right now. Amen. Come on, Harvest Temple. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that your spirit is here and even with the unbeliever. Convicting them of sin, righteousness and the coming judgment. And we pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, for that strong conviction to turn hearts in this sanctuary and watching in the virtual space. Turn those hearts towards Jesus Christ. And his sacrifice on the cross. Lord Jesus, you pay the price. For we all were born in sin. We all have fallen short of your glory. We've all sinned, Lord. And so we pray, God, as you've done for us. And we are your evidence this afternoon. Will you do the same for those, Lord, whose hearts are now ready to receive Jesus Christ? As they cry out and ask for forgiveness, Lord God. Cleanse their hearts, Lord, by a move of your spirit, by the power of your word. Transform them, make them into new creations in Christ Jesus. Let the old go, Lord, and let a brand new come as they are birthed into the kingdom of God. Those are struggling now, Lord, who have heard this message over and over. We pray that you would loose them from every bondage, from every excuse. Oh God, those who think they own time and in their own time, they will make this decision. I pray you will impress on their hearts today the urgency to respond to this call of your spirit today. Now is the day of salvation. Hallelujah. And so we thank you, God. Thank you, God, for those who are now transitioned as a result of your word and your spirit and our prayers into your kingdom. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. And we bless you. Amen. We're going to pray now for ourselves. God wants to continue that work of transformation in us. Don't suppress the Spirit of God at work in your life. Don't quench the Spirit, the, the, the Scripture says. Sometimes God is calling us to do things and we think it's going to be to our disadvantage because we've, we've figured it out, we've sussed it out. 
We're thinking, no, I, I, I know I'm going to resolve this, God. I, I know what type of person I'm going to be. But God is saying, give that up to me. Receive my word. Let me transform you from the inside. That, that's how the Holy Spirit works. From the inside and it's revealed outside. So we're praying that and we're also praying for more of his outpouring. More of his spirit upon us that we are empowered to transform the lives of others. Can we pray that together now, church? Father, I thank you for those who are standing at this altar and there are so many pews. I include myself in this prayer. Lord, I, I know at times I've been stubborn and have resisted your, your move and your promptings. And I, I am sorry, God. I ask you to forgive me. Forgive us all. Forgive us, Lord. We're sorry, Lord. Help us to stop suppressing and quenching the move of your spirit. Which is not just when we're in this church space and everyone's feeling happy. But at times you speak to us through the preacher, from a song, through the, the pages of scripture. Lord, and sometimes our hearts have become so callous and, and hardened. And the more we resist, it's the harder our hearts become. Soften our hearts, oh God. That today we will know it is more important to obey you and bring forth immediate obedience. It's more important to make those adjustments by your grace in our lives. Than to hold out and to have our own way. Lord, these things are hindering us from really flowing in your spirit and being all that you want us to be. But today, today, Lord, today we lay them down. Today, Father, today. And we invite your Holy Spirit to do a transforming work on the inside of us. Some of us are experiencing pain, disappointments, anger. Lord, some of us feel that we, we can just do it ourselves. We, we, we can just be independent of you. But we can't be independent of you, Lord. We need you. We need you, Father. So we cry out to you, oh God. We need your help. Transform our lives, Lord. Wash us now with the water of the word of God. Sanctify us with your truth. Your holy word is truth. Strip out our self-deceit and, and lies and false conceptions. Lord God, drain those things out of our spirit and fill us anew with the power of your Holy Spirit. We thirst, Lord, we thirst. Give us the drink. Let those rivers of life-giving water flow from out of our being, oh God, as our lives convict those around us that you are the resurrected Christ, the King of glory, in the name of Jesus.